Good morning, Memorial Presbyterian Church, friends and family. I want to welcome you to our online Sunday morning worship service for January the 24th, 2021. Uh, before we get started, I just want to say thank you so much to all of you who have been praying for us and uh, sending my family messages and, and uh, cards and also uh, stopping by with food. Thank you so much for all the ways that you are uh, caring for us. As uh, I'm sure most of you already know, my uh, our family has has COVID. My uh, my wife tested positive. I guess it's over a week ago now, and uh, we're we're doing well. But uh, Elizabeth and my daughter Annalie are are both still showing some symptoms. So I would ask for your continued prayer. Uh, I'm not I'm not worried. I think they're they're doing fine, but they're just uh, dealing with the the lingering effects of of the virus. So I would encourage uh, continued prayer for them, and I, I thank you for that. Um, the The boys are all doing well. Um, Gideon and Caleb both had some minor symptoms. Uh, Joshua and I have had no symptoms, so uh, we thank the Lord for that. And uh, but for the meantime, now we're, we're going to continue to be quarantined. And uh, as you already know, the session has already decided uh, uh, at least for one more week after this Sunday to continue with online worship services only. Uh, and and we'll reevaluate that after the next week, and then we'll let you know what what our plan is moving forward. So, let's get started with, with our worship this morning. We're going we're gonna to have a call to worship now from Matthew, the book of, of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. This is the word of God. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And so this is what Jesus is calling the church to be. This is what Jesus is calling his people to be. We are to be salt in, and light in a, in a dark world. That's what we are called to be. And that's a challenge to us today. Is that indeed what, what we, the people of God, what, what his church is today? So with that in mind, let's, let's approach the Lord now in prayer and ask him to bless this time together. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you have called us out of darkness into your glorious light. Father, we thank you that you have called your people, your church, to, uh, to gather this morning, even, even virtually, to come together to lift our hearts up in prayer before you and to hear your word. Father, we pray that your spirit would be at work in us, even as we are not meeting together in person. We pray that your spirit would be with each one of us in the, in the, the households and various places that we are. Oh, Father, we pray that you would continue your work in us. Lord, we long for the day when we can be together again as a church family, meeting together under the same roof. And Father, we pray that that day would come soon. But until that time, Lord, I ask that you would help us, Father, help us to be content in the state in which we are now for this temporary time. I pray, O oh Lord, that you, would, that you would guide us this morning. I pray, Father, that you would speak to our hearts by, the, by your word and your spirit. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we approach the Lord, we want to come before him in a posture of, of humility recognizing that, that we are sinners who are in need of a Savior. And so with that in mind, I want to take a look now at Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to, to use this passage to help us think about our, our own lives and to help us think through this last week. Ephesians four twenty nine through 31 says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. 
And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. And so let's, let's think about that and, and, and take a moment now to evaluate our lives this week. Are there words that came through our, our lips that shouldn't have this week? Are there things that we said to one another that after they came out, you know, we realized we really should not have said that? Are there, are there things that we have said that, that have not been salt and light in this world? Have we been careful in, in the way that we post things online or the way that we talk to our friends or our family about other people? Are we making sure that, that we ourselves are not, are not guilty of, of bitterness or rage or, or malice or, or slander? Let's take a moment to go before the Lord and, and to confess the state of our hearts to him. Will you join your heart in prayer with mine? Father, in the quietness of our hearts, we recognize that, that not everything in our heart is as it should be before you. Oh Lord, there are times when we have harbored bitterness, times when we have been angry, times when we have not been careful with the truth. Father, there are, are times when we have said things that, that we know that we shouldn't have, and so we ask your forgiveness. Father, we pray that, that you would forgive us for the anger that resides in our hearts. Uh, Father, we pray that you would help us to submit ourselves, to recognize that, that our plan does not always line up with your plan. Father, we recognize that, that we don't understand your plan and that so many things happen on this earth that, that, that we would think that we ought to do differently. And yet, Father, please forgive us. Please help us to submit to you, your timing, your plans, your goodness, and your grace. Thank you, Father, for the love that you've shown in Christ and the assurance of forgiveness and grace that we have because of him. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. And Ephesians 4 goes on in verse 32 to say, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. We've been forgiven because of what Jesus has accomplished for us. We have forgiveness that extends even beyond the deepest of our sins. And we'll be talking about that more today as we go on. But let's, let's praise God for his goodness, his grace, his mercy, and his love for us, his children.
Let's pray together once again. O Lord God, Father in heaven, we come before you recognizing your good, your gracious nature, your your mercy, your power, your love. O Father, there is nothing that we can think, say, or do that escapes your your glance. Father, we're, we're so thankful that because of Jesus Christ, we're assured that you look on us not, not in condemnation, not uh, out of retribution, but out of love, out of compassion, out of a, a desire to unite us to your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and to bring us into eternal relationship with you. Father, thank you. Lord, it's because of that relationship that we can come before you. It's because of that relationship that, that we have hope for everything, uh, everything in our lives and everything around us. Oh, Lord, it is so easy for us to get discouraged when we look around. Father, it is, it's so easy for us to place our trust in, in external things, things other than you, and Lord, they so quickly disappoint us. Father, I pray that you would help us now more than ever to be, to be solid, solidly steadfast, depending on, on you and you alone. Father, help us, help us not to be surprised when people fail us. Help us not to be surprised when, when the things on earth that we trusted in turn out to not be everything that they said they were going to be. Father, we pray in all of this. We pray that through every trial we go through, through every bit of pain, suffering, that, that we would cling to you, that, that our relationship would become ever more dear, uh, that, that your love would shine ever more clearly in our lives. Father, I know that, that there are those who are members of, of this body, of this congregation, who are, are struggling every day those who are, are suffering with long-term pain. And Father, I pray that you would be with them. Father, show yourselves to them this day. I pray that you would help them to know your, your love and compassion, even in the midst of pain. Father, we know that it, it's through the, the crucible of, of, of pain and, and, and suffering so often that you draw us near. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to, to endure so that, so that our, our relationship with you would be, would be purified and would be, become the most beautiful thing to us. Father, we continue uh, to go through these days recognizing that, that these are strange days. Father, you know that, that we long to be together again. We long to be able to spend time with friends. We long to do the things that we used to, to do all the time and, and, and took for granted. Father, we, we miss being able to spend time together. And Lord, that, that, that does damage to us. We know emotionally, Father. Lord, I pray that you would help us through this. Father, I pray that, that, that you would help us to use these days wisely and well. Father, thank you for, for the gifts we have of this age that, uh, that enable us to, to have some kind of connection. Thank you, Lord, that, that we're able to even meet together online as we are right now. Father, thank you for, for the other technological advances that, that we can enjoy that, that generations in the past did not. Father, we pray that, that your gospel will continue to be preached. Oh Lord, we pray that in the midst of the challenges of these days, that your church would be purified. Father, we pray that, that those who have not stayed true to the gospel will, will fall away. But Lord, we pray that the, the gospel would be made even more clear than it has in the past. Father, we pray that in the midst of these difficulties, that more and more people would come to know Jesus would claim him as Lord and Savior, would repent of their sin and cling to you. Father, we ask that, that you would use us. We pray that you would use Memorial Presbyterian Church in whatever form we are in. Lord, even, even if we're not meeting together in person, we pray that you, you would use each of us in, in whatever small ways we are able to be used right now. 
Father, help us as we, as we are at home and as we spend so much time just within our own families. Father, help us to, to be able to show grace, love, patience, and mercy to each other. Father, help us to, to treat each other the way that you have treated us. Lord, we ask now that, that you would guide us as we look at your word. Father, your word, your word says some strong things, things that we would not naturally think or say. But Father, your word teaches us your way. And so, Father, we pray that as we look at your word, that, that our hearts would be challenged and changed. I, I pray, Father, that, that you would guide us, guide our thoughts, our minds. Help us, Father, to be able to, to set aside all the things around us and to, to pay attention to what your eternal word has to say to us today. Thank you, Father, for your work in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to dive back into the book of Luke. Today, we're going to look at Luke 17. And we're going to look at a passage that, that Jesus gives some teaching specifically to his disciples in Luke 17. You know, much of his teaching up until now has, has been uh, to a much broader audience, uh, to a much larger crowd, but, but this particular moment here in Luke 17, we know is directed specifically to those who are following Jesus. And so here in just a, a, a few short verses, Jesus is, is going to give uh, strong words, both of warning and also strong words of mercy and forgiveness in just a few short verses. So as we take a look at this today, you know, we need to consider how Jesus' words are, are going to apply to our lives. I know that, that most of us who are listening would probably call ourselves followers of Jesus. And so, so we need to pay attention to these words that Jesus gave directly to his followers. Let's, let's, let's pay careful attention. I'll be, I'll be reading now from Luke 17, verses 1 through 6 of the English Standard Version. This is the word of the Lord. And he said to his disciples, Temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, Forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a grain of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it would obey you. Pray with me once again. Oh Lord, we ask that you would use these words to challenge and change our hearts and to drive us closer to you. Father, be with us as we hear things that, that may be hard today, things that we might not want to hear. But Father, I pray that you, would, that you would till the soil of our hearts so that they would be tender to your words. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, there's three points that we're going to look at today. Uh, number one is the severity of leading others into sin. The severity of leading others into sin. Number two is the severity of real forgiveness. The severity of real forgiveness. And number three, the severity of true faith. The severity of true faith. So first, we need to talk about the severity of leading others into sin. Jesus talks about this in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 17. He said, Temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Now those are strong words. Those are severe words. You know, when we first read this passage, I think that the obvious thing that that 
probably comes into our minds is that Jesus wants us to be extremely careful how we lead people, especially the ones that he calls the little ones. And I think most of our minds go to children when he says that. And certainly he is talking about children there. But I think the idea goes beyond just children. This passage really speaks to the way that, that people who have some sort of leadership or authority or power over other people use that leadership or power or authority. The little ones really could be anyone who doesn't have that same kind of authority or power or leadership or that same voice or influence as, as the leaders would have. These, are, these verses are really talking about about those who lead and influence other people. Jesus has strong words to say to those who would be in leadership. We have a responsibility to use that leadership very, very carefully. Our words and our actions matter. You know, at the end of 1945, after the Second World War, Several prominent Nazi Germany, uh, leaders of Nazi Germany were put on trial in Nuremberg, Germany. Uh, you may have heard of the, the, the Nuremberg trials already. Uh, all of these people who were on trial were, were known for the ways that they had acted and, and, and carried out Hitler's vision of the thousand year German Reich. But when they were put on trial after the war had ended, when they were forced to explain the atrocities of the Nazi regime before an international panel of judges, you know, they, they all claimed a, a similar defense. They all said, we were just following orders. We were carrying out Hitler's vision. Uh, shouldn't he be the one held responsible? You know, even, even Hermann Goering, who was the commander of the Luftwaffe, the, the German Air Force, he was the, the highest ranking officer that was there on trial. He said this, and I quote, Of course the people don't want war. But after all, it's the leaders of the country who determine the policy. And it's a simple, it's always a simple matter to drag the people along, whether it's a democracy, a fascist dictatorship, or a parliament, or a communist dictatorship. Voice or no voice, the people can always be brought to the bidding of the leaders. That is easy. All you have to do is tell them they are being attacked and denounce the pacifists for their lack of patriotism and for exposing the country to greater danger. Those were the words of Hermann Goring. You know, Hitler was already gone by that time. Many of those men at Nuremberg would, would still end up carrying the responsibility of their own actions in the form of uh, life in prison or the death sentence. But Goring's words there were not wrong. It is the leader who is responsible for the vision, the direction, and the actions of the people who are following him or her. Jesus says, temptations are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. Words matter. Actions of leaders matter. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. This is a severe warning from Jesus. You know, especially when you consider who he was speaking to. The, these, the people listening were not enemies of Jesus. They were his disciples, you know, with the exception of, of the traitor Judas, who was probably in their midst at the same time. But, but for the most part, the people hearing this loved Jesus. They wanted his kingdom to come. They wanted Jesus to, to succeed. But Jesus knew that one day these very disciples would be leading the church after he had ascended to heaven. He, he knew just how important it was that these men that he had chosen would not lead people into sin. You know, in fact, the, the consequences are so great here for those who lead into people into sin that he says it would be better for their lives to be ended than for them to lead others into sin. Note, Jesus isn't saying that if someone leads others into sin that they would be cast into the bottom of the sea. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that being cast into the bottom of the sea would be better than leading others into sin. That's how important this is. 
Uh, these are, are grave words. You know, as, as a leader in, in Jesus' church, I, I have to think through these words on a regular basis, any time before I speak to a group of people. Uh, one commentary that, that I read this week wrote about this passage. He said, it would be better to die even a horrible death than to cause a little one to stumble and ultimately to incur the woe of which Jesus warns. Better for the disciple or leader or pastor to die than to teach errant doctrine. Better to die than to have a lifestyle that trips up others. Better to die than to have attitudes that drive others away from Christ. You know, there are many, many Christian leaders in the church in America today that, that would be wise to consider these words. You know, this is, this is why it is so important that, that your pastors, that, that Bible teachers, study the word so diligently. Yes, you know, every Christian, every Christian should read and try to understand God's word. That's something that we should all be doing. But, but not everyone, not everyone is called to be a pastor or a teacher. Not everyone is, is called to lead in the church. It's a heavy responsibility. And, and for all of us, whether we're in leadership or not, we need to be careful who we are listening to. We need to, to ask ourselves, what, what books are we reading? What, what social media are we subscribing to? Who are we following? What teachers or pastors do we listen to? Who are we allowing to influence us? I don't know about you, but I have seen in recent days pastors and self-proclaimed Christian speakers who've led people in, in direct opposition to things that Jesus has said that he wants for his followers. You know, I, I don't know about you, but, but I've seen Christians who are more interested in, in power, in politics, in, in money, and, and in hatred than they are in the fruit of the Spirit. I've seen Christians who are, are so obsessed with who is, who is sitting in the Oval Office that it doesn't seem to matter to them who is sitting on the throne of heaven. You know, with, with the recent transfer of power this week, in our country, I've seen both Christians who believe that the world is about to end and Christians who think that a president can save us all. Neither one of those things is true. And woe to Christians if we preach them. You know, of course the things that are happening in our country matter. Of course those are important. Of course they are. But they are not the primary thing for the followers of Jesus Christ. Yes, we wanna seek justice and righteousness in our land. Yes, we want, we want to see that, but we don't want to do that at the expense of our own integrity, at the expense of, of doing what Jesus has called us individually to do. You remember what Galatians 5 says. It, it says, the works of the flesh are evident, enmity, strife, jealousy, Fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus has, have, have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. Can I ask which one of these lists better describes where we've been in this last month? Do we, do we hold up those people who lead us, those, those people who, who have an influence over us? Do, do we hold these people up and, and compare them to the list that Galatians 5 gives us? Do we ask, are these people who, who I listen to, are they demonstrating the fruit of the Spirit? Jesus said in Matthew 7, 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. 
Let's be careful about who we consider to be authorities and also just as careful about the influence that we ourselves have over others. Jesus said leading others into sin is a severe issue. But Jesus is just as severe in the way that he describes true forgiveness. He, he, he goes directly into another topic at this very next verse, verse 3. Notice he says, pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. That's also pretty severe, isn't it? Let's think about this passage a little bit. Jesus says that if your brother sins against you seven times in the day and repents seven times, then you must forgive him. Why, why seven times? Well, seven is a, is a very symbolic number. Uh, in, in the ancient Near East. And that's why it gets used a lot in Scripture, particularly in the book of, of Revelation. Uh, but the number seven is usually used to represent an idea of, of completeness, of, of fullness, of, of wholeness, even, even perfection. It means that something is, is completely full or, or satisfied. It is, it is that thing to its fullest extent. You know, if you went to a banquet in the ancient Middle East and, uh, and, and someone asked you how your meal was, you could say, well, it was great. I had seven courses. And of course, the idea is that with seven courses, you would be completely full. You had had all the food you could possibly want and you are now filled up, satisfied completely. So, so what's the idea here? Well, I, you know, I know that if someone had had sinned against me seven times in the same day, my, my patience with them would, would be gone. Uh, you know, in, in fact, usually by the second or the third time someone does something, I start to get pretty irritable if I, if I haven't already been irritable. Uh, that's just when somebody does something that's a, a minor annoyance. I'm not even talking about uh, something that is, that is significantly evil. So what is Jesus talking about when he says someone who sins against you seven times in a day? I mean, that seems pretty severe, doesn't it? Pastor Tim Keller explains it this way. He says, it's actually worse than you think. If someone sins against you seven times in a day, he is saying it's as if a person would, would wrong you as completely and as fully as any person could wrong another human being. Imagine the worst that anyone could possibly do, and, and all of us would imagine something different. It, it would be something so completely bad that nothing beyond it is even possible. Jesus is saying, if you're my disciple and someone wrongs you like that, you have to forgive them. Wow. I'd say that's pretty severe. It's no wonder that the disciples say in verse 5, increase our faith. I mean, it's almost like they're saying to Jesus, you've got to be kidding. That's not possible. It just can't be done. We can't forgive like that. No one is, no one is that holy. No one is that perfect. No one is that much of a saint. Uh, we just can't do it, Jesus. But, you know, Jesus' words here, are, are fascinating. Did, did you notice how he started talking in verse 3? Do you notice what he said there? He said, he told the disciples, pay attention to yourselves. Now, how often is it that we do that when we've just been wronged? You know, if someone, if someone uh, uh, offends me or hurts me, does my attention go to my, myself and my behavior, my reactions? Not usually. Not, not for me anyway. It, it naturally goes to that person who has wronged me. My attention is now on, on the perpetrator of this, this grave injustice. But, but that's not what Jesus tells us to do. He says, pay attention to yourself. Why does he do that? Why does he do that? Well, Hebrews 12, 15 says, See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, 
that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. Jesus wants us to watch ourselves when we've been wronged. He knows that our tendency is, is to become angry, to want justice. And, and, and those things in themselves are not necessarily wrong. God, God wants justice too. He has righteous anger at sin. It's not, those things are not necessarily wrong. But Jesus is trying to save us from further pain here. He knows that the natural tendency when we are wronged is not to seek forgiveness, but to seek vengeance, to seek retribution, to want to, to pay back that person who has wronged us. He knows that's, that's our natural, natural default pattern. And as long as we seek vengeance, then we're just gonna perpetuate the cycle of wrongdoing. We're just gonna make it happen over and over and over again. And we ourselves will eventually become defiled with bitterness if we don't seek forgiveness. I once heard a pastor help his congregation understand the idea of bitterness by looking at four different English words. They all come from the same old English root word. And, and the four words all start with, with a W. Wrath, wreath, writhe, and wraith. They all come from the same English root word. You probably know what each one of them means individually, uh, but they're actually all connected. Uh, wrath, as I'm sure you probably know, means anger. It's an old English word for anger. Uh, there's actually an old, older meaning to it, but you, you also probably all know what a wreath is. Uh, we had a wreath hanging up on our door over Christmas time. You know, it's, it's uh, a bunch of branches that are all twisted together into a circular shape. You probably also know what the word writhe means. It, uh, writhe means to experience pain, but it's, it's not just experiencing pain, is it? it? It means to be twisted up and distorted in pain. Twisted, just like the branches of a wreath. And that helps us to understand wrath a little bit better too. Wrath is an anger that twists us up or distorts us. And the last word is wraith. What, what is a wraith? Well, a wraith is a, it's an old English word for a ghost. But it's not just any ghost. It's, it's, a wraith is a soul that has been wronged in life. And now all that is left is a, a twisted remnant of what was once a person. It, it, uh, it was a soul in torment over all the evils that it experienced in life. And now it's a, a twisted, distorted remnant of, of its former self. Now, listen, those, those aren't necessarily biblical descriptions of bitterness, but they are old English words that describe the effects of unforgiveness. When we become bitter, we can become twisted and disfigured. Jesus wants us to watch ourselves when we're offended because we could end up doing far greater damage to ourselves by not forgiving than by whatever it is that offended us to begin with. He says, see to it that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. You know, I think probably most of us who have been in church for a long time know that the Bible tells us to forgive. But what does it mean to forgive? How do we do that? Well, if we look back at verse 3, it says, If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. Don't miss those important steps there. Jesus says that we need to rebuke our brother when he sins against us. Forgiveness, forgiveness doesn't mean that we become a doormat for people to, to step on. That's not forgiveness at all. It, it doesn't mean that we should open ourselves up to continual abuse to, by someone who has power over us. Notice it says a brother, not, not a father, not an authority figure. When someone hurts you, call them out on it. But, you know, I, I do want to acknowledge here that there are a lot of relationships in our, in our lives that we might have where calling someone out is, is not necessarily a simple task. 
Uh, in fact, you know, the very nature of abusive relationships makes it so that an abused person can't rebuke their abuser without risking further pain or retribution to themselves. That's the, the sick and twisted nature of, of so much abuse. An, an abuser is a person who, who, who has power over, over an abused person. And, and they do everything possible to normalize that situation so that there doesn't seem to be any means of escape for the abused. You know, in a, in a case like that, rebuking the brother in sin means getting out of that situation. I want to make sure that everyone hears me loud and clear on this. Forgiveness does not excuse or ignore sinful behavior. Forgiveness does not excuse or ignore sinful behavior. That isn't what Jesus did for you on the cross. He, does, he doesn't ignore your sin. It's not what he's asking you to do when he asks you to forgive. Um, Christian counselor Dr. Dr. Diane Langberg said, The process of forgiveness begins with the truth about sin and its consequences. Neither grace nor forgiveness means letting people do what they want or, or giving them what they feel they must have. That's not forgiveness. Jesus never asks us, to let an unrepentant sinner abuse us. He doesn't do that. If you're in some kind of relationship where you are being verbally, physically, or sexually abused, that abuse needs to be rebuked. And if that person holds some kind of power or authority over you, you don't need to do that alone. You need to seek help. You need to seek someone who can, who can help protect you in that situation. There are good Christian counselors out there who can help. You can, you can come and talk to me or our session. We will, we will do what we can to help you. Forgiveness does not mean allowing someone to continually sin against you. So how do we forgive? What, how do we forgive? What, what does forgiveness look like? How do we forgive someone completely, even seven times a day, just like Jesus said? It, it still just seems so impossible. You know, we're, we're still left here like the disciples who are saying, increase our faith, because it just doesn't seem humanly possible to do what, what Jesus said. When someone has so severely wronged us, it, it just seems impossible to forgive. But Jesus tells his disciples, if you had faith like a grain of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and, and it would obey you. Now, what is he talking about there? What, what does that mean? What does that mean? Well, it, it means that just as, as real forgiveness seems impossible, true faith is more than adequate to accomplish what would seem impossible to us. True faith is able to overcome the creeping roots of bitterness that would, that would twist us into an angry old man or an angry old woman. Faith is the one thing that can truly enable us to really forgive. True faith can lead to real forgiveness that is even more severe than the most painful sin. Why is that? It's because true faith requires us to tell the truth about both the sin of others and my own sin. So often when we are hurt or sinned against, the tendency of our hearts is, is to make an enemy of the other person. That's, that's, that's what the sin inside of us tends to do. We can so easily disassociate ourselves from that other person. We dehumanize them. We end up creating a picture in our minds of that person that looks more like a, more like a cartoon villain than it does a, a real human being. You know, psychologists know, they often have said that, that abusers justify their own actions by dehumanizing their victims. But, the, but what, what we don't often talk about is, is the fact that when we are hurt, we have a tendency to do the same thing. We have a, we have a tendency to justify our bitterness and our anger against, against that person who hurt us by seeing them as less than human. Their sin does not justify our own sin. Real forgiveness will not come until both sides are willing to see each other as human. 
One pastor I know said that it is impossible to stay angry at someone else unless you feel just a little bit superior to them. When someone sins against you, there's that, that part of inside of you that says, well, I would never do something like that. I would never do what they did. But the reality is that because you're a sinner, you certainly could do something like that. Or you could do something even worse. Forgiveness can only come when you recognize that both parties are human and both parties are sinners. Now listen, saying that does not, does not excuse the sin of the perpetrator. Their sin is their sin and it before God will be dealt with. But it does not excuse an offended person to sin against them. Uh, Miroslav Volf is a Croatian Christian. Uh, he's, the, he's the son of a Croatian pastor uh, who spent time in, in the labor camps of, of Soviet Yugoslavia. He lived through the fall of the communist system uh, and the Yugoslavian civil war. He, now Miroslav Volf lives in the U.S. He's taught in seminaries and universities. He's written a number of, of books. But in his life, he has seen plenty of war. He has seen a, a lot of sin, a lot of anger, and a lot of bitterness. He's seen hatred and resentment in the people, in, in people all over. This is what he says in one of his books about forgiveness. He writes, Forgiveness flounders because I exclude the enemy from the community of, of humans, even as I exclude myself from the community of sinners. But no one can be in the presence of the God of the crucified Messiah for long without overcoming this double exclusion without transposing the enemy from the sphere of the monstrous into the sphere of shared humanity, and herself from the sphere of proud innocence into the sphere of common sinfulness. When one knows, as the cross demonstrates, that the torturer will not eternally triumph over the victim, one is free to, dis to rediscover that person's humanity and even imitate God's love for him. And when one knows, as the cross demonstrates, that God's love is greater than all sin, one is free to see oneself in the light of God's justice and so rediscover one's own sinfulness. Now, I know that, that may be a mouthful, but, but did you see what he is saying? Do you understand what Miroslav Volf said there? He's saying it's the cross of Christ that enables us to really forgive someone else. When we see ourselves in the light of God's grace and the forgiveness that he offered us at the cross, then, then we are actually able to extend forgiveness to someone else. Forgiveness is not, it's not about just forgetting someone else's sin. That's not forgiveness. It's not about making that person pay for their sin. That, that's, not, that's not forgiveness either. It's actually something else entirely. It's about dealing with the sin in a way that restores right relationships. True forgiveness comes when sin is acknowledged and repented of by the offender. And the offended person stops seeking retribution and instead makes a conscious effort to let God deal justly with the offender. Diane Langberg said, what forgiveness looks like in any situation is not to be governed by what would make the family feel better, but rather by what would call each and every member to a restored relationship to God himself. Anything less will not honor him. Did you hear that? Forgiveness is not dependent on our feelings. Forgiveness is not dependent on our feelings. We might never feel warm, fuzzy feelings about a person who has hurt us. That's okay. That's okay. That's not what forgiveness is. What is important is a determination to do to that person what is loving and just to them. We fight against developing our own bitterness by making a conscious effort not to seek retribution from the person, but instead to give them up to God. 
Forgiveness doesn't mean that the relationship will be exactly the same as it was before the offenses started. It doesn't mean that. Forgiving someone doesn't mean that you automatically trust that person again. That, that would not be wise. In fact, sometimes the most loving way that you can treat a person who has hurt you is, is by setting boundaries and sticking to them. That might mean that in order to forgive a person, you actually have to be physically away from them for a while. Sometimes their, their sins against us may even need to come to a more public light. There, there may be legal consequences that, that have to be carried out. And yes, sometimes that's the most forgiving thing. Forgiving someone doesn't, doesn't mean that the offender doesn't face the consequences of their actions. It means that we commit ourselves to not doing evil to that person in return. And to seek the Lord's justice and righteousness for that person. That's forgiveness. It's not about the way we feel. That's what Jesus meant when he said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you in Matthew 5. When we forgive, we commit to seeking the Lord's best for that person. Dan Hamilton is an author who writes for InterVarsity Press. When he was a young man, he got engaged. But after a brief period of time, uh, soon before they were supposed to get married, she broke off the engagement with him. And, and he writes some about that experience. He wrote about it, Once upon a time I was engaged to a woman who changed her mind. I forgave her, but in small sums over a year. Done whenever, whenever I spoke to her and, and refrained from rehashing the past. Done whenever I renounced jealousy and pity when seeing her with another man. Done when I praised her to others when I wanted to slice away at her reputation. Those were the payments of forgiveness, but she never saw them. Pain is the consequence of sin. There is no easy way to deal with it. Wood, nails, and pain are the currency of forgiveness, the love that heals. You see what he's saying? Forgiveness is hard. Forgiveness is hard. Sin always carries consequences. When we forgive another person of their sin against us, we are making a decision not to sin against that person. We are deciding not to talk about them behind their back. We're deciding not to secretly wish evil on that person or to do anything evil to that person. That's difficult. It's hard. It can even be painful to us. Because in order to do in order to really forgive someone, we may end up bearing some amount of pain on ourselves because of the sins of the offender. But don't shy away from bearing pain because it's a small picture of what the gospel itself is. As Christians, we are people who believe that while we were still sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. Jesus Christ bore the ultimate cost of, of our forgiveness on the cross of Calvary. It's only through Jesus' painful act of taking on all of our offenses that we are able to be reconciled to the Father. We could not be forgiven any other way, but Jesus willingly did it. He, he laid down his life and was willing to bear the cost, bear the pain of the penalty of sin for you and I. And now, because of that, our relationship with God the Father is restored the moment we repent of our sin and accept his gift of forgiveness. I'm sure the pain of forgiveness didn't feel very good for Jesus. It didn't feel good when he was betrayed by his disciples. I'm sure he didn't enjoy the pain of the scourge on his back. I'm, I'm certain that the abuse that he endured from the Pharisees and from Herod and from Pilate was, was enough. It, it would be enough for all of us if we were to endure it to say, that's enough, forget it. I, 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 I just can't do this. Forgiving everyone else is too hard. I can't bear this weight. But Jesus didn't do that. He bore it all on himself 
As Hebrews 12, 2 says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Look at Jesus. Knowing him, experiencing the forgiveness of God himself is the only way that we will ever be able to look at someone who is offended and, and, and say to them, I forgive you and I will not treat you with evil in my heart. Friends, let's be careful. Let's be careful about the examples that we set. Let's be careful about the, the people that we allow to influence us. We must be careful not to lead others into sin, but we also must be quick to forgive. God's forgiveness is more severe than even the most severe of our sins. When we have faith that he has forgiven our sins, then we have everything that we need to commit ourselves to forgiving those who have offended us. Will you join with me in prayer? Father, thank you for the forgiveness that you have offered to us through your son, Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord, help us. Help us to forgive. It's hard. It's painful. Lord, give us the wisdom to know how to do it well. Father, we pray that you would protect us from having, from having bitter or twisted hearts. And Lord, protect us from further sin by those who are still offending us even now. Father, I pray that you would help us. Help us, Lord, to be careful in the way that we influence others. Help us to be careful in the ways that we allow ourselves to be influenced. Lord, we ask that you would give us the wisdom to live well according to your word. And help us, Father, to be forgiving people because we know that we have been forgiven because of the cross of your Son, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. And hear our benediction from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. May Christ dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen. Go in peace.